Researching this story filled me with a sense of somber familiarity. Although a world away and over 60 years old, it's like I have grown to know the people in this story. They were real, imperfect, strong-willed, and full of depth, character, and soul. My heart aches to share this story with you now. If you're not familiar, nine young hikers under vexing circumstances suffered and died during the early frigid months of 1959 in the northern regions of the Soviet Union, leaving behind a mystery that, despite claims to the contrary to this day, remains unsolved. The Dyatlov Pass incident has spawned extreme contention over what actually happened. And to be sure, there is no shortage of theories. One thing to me is certain though, the incident can't be chalked up to one singular event. It seems as though that multiple very strange things happened overlapping each other to cause a devastating perfect storm. The events of February 2nd, 1959 in the mountains of Northern Ural have gone down in history and truly the world over has talked of it extensively. Please like this video right now, subscribe, and help me continue to share these stories with you by supporting me on Patreon. Without further ado, this is part one of Diotlev Pass and the futile struggle for survival on Dead Mountain. Igor Diotlev, a natural leader, smart, compassionate and strong-willed, at only 23 years old, assembled a group of nine other experienced hikers and long-distance skiers to tackle one of the most difficult routes in the region. The group consisted of 10 in total, with eight men and two women, all in their early 20s. He handpicked each person, each he knew well, and each was a grade two hiker with extensive ski experience. This trek, upon completion, would give each of them a grade three certification. It was the highest one you could get at the time. So everyone in the group was excited and prepared for the journey. They were all confident, exceptional young men and women, strong and ready to take on the challenge. The challenge being ascending Mount Otorten. The range, however, was known for its hostile conditions. In fact, the natives, the Mansi people, had a name for the range. They called it Dead Mountain. Its ominous namesake, however, dissipated. Under the optimistic words of a member of the group, Yuri Krivoshenko, in his poem written just a month prior to their departure, offered his hopes for the future of himself and his friends. He wrote, Let your backpacks be light, weather always fine, winter not too cold, and summer to be mild. Your shoes to be good, not a year, but dozens of years. Wish you're to leave your tracks all over the map of Russia. With those hopes in mind, on January 23rd, 1959, as a group was preparing to leave the city, the Sverdlovsk City Committee approved an 11th person to join their, their group. Semyon Zolotaryov made a last-minute addition. At first, the Dyatlov group didn't really appreciate the fact that a stranger was being thrust upon them on such short notice. They didn't know him, and he was also much older than the rest of him. He was in his late 30s. It was an odd addition, to say the least, but the city commission insisted he go with the group, and so he did. Around that same time, Slavic Bianco, one of Igor's original picks, for unknown reasons, was barred from going on the journey. The local faculty bureau wouldn't let him go for some reason. And so, with a last minute addition and a last minute cancellation, the group boarded a bus to the train station to head to their starting point, and they were expected back around the 13th of February when Igor would send a telegram. Igor wrote optimistically, and here we are on the train. We sang all the songs that we know, learned new ones, everyone goes to sleep at 3 a.m. I wonder, what awaits us in this trip? What will we encounter? Early on the 24th, they arrived in Serov, where Yuri Krivoshenko was caught up in the spirit of singing a song and also petitioning others at the train station for money. <laughs> the local police didn't appreciate it and Yuri was detained for a period of time. 
but the infraction was quickly dealt with, he was scolded and ultimately let go. The Olive group learned their lesson, no singing at the train station. It's here that Zina Komogorova wrote to her family. Hello, my dear mom, dad, Tom, Galia, and Lucia. Greetings to you from Zina. Has a cow calved yet? I love milk. How is mom's work? How is dad's health? How are Galia and Lucia doing at school? See you soon, and goodbye. Big kisses to all of you. Your Zena. Write to me in Viz Hey, I'm looking forward to it. The group then made their way to Ivdel by another train early January 25th, and from there, they drove by bus, and they had to cram in as a parent in this photo. Multiple of them discussed how cramped it was, being stacked three high on top of all of their equipment. They went from there to Viz Hay, where they would spend the evening laughing, being friends, enjoying the company of their new friend, Semyon, who knew all sorts of new songs to sing, and they even watched a movie together, Symphony in Gold. Ludmia Dubanina was particularly impressed with the flick. We are extremely lucky, she wrote. The symphony in gold was showing. We left all of our things and packs at the hotel and went to the club. The image was a bit fuzzy, but it didn't overshadow the pleasure at all. This is real happiness. So difficult to describe with words. The music is just fabulous. Igor Dyatlov was unrecognizable. He tried to dance and even started singing. Oh, Jackie Joe. And after a fun-filled evening the next morning, they made it to Logging District 41 by truck. And it's here where Yuri Yudin found the time to critique the symphony in gold himself. It seemed as though he was eager to get his feelings about this movie off of his chest. The ballet itself is a good show, he starts. Good skating rinks, skill, technical performance, but feelings, thoughts in dances, none. The light music in places is excellent. It can't be better, but in general, I couldn't feel the person, his soul. And then Rustam Slobodin at this time wrote home himself. Yesterday, we safely reached the village of Vizhay. Now we are taking a truck to the starting point. The weather is nice, warm, 10 to 15 degrees. Everything is good. I'm sorry I didn't say goodbye. I got carried away. All the best, R. Slobodin. On the 27th of January, they started out on skis toward Oturtin for the first time and hired a local horse to carry their packs a part of the way. Yuri. Doroshenko noted that they were near to a local geological site, and the locals sang illegal prison songs. Everything is well, he wrote. We were talking and joking till three in the morning. And then on the 28th, Yuri Yudin found himself in pain, a sharp, stinging pain through his left thigh. He couldn't continue on with the trip. He was, however, a scientist, so he took advantage of his situation and made his way to a nearby geological site, the one which Doroshenko had previously mentioned. He looked for minerals in the hills, and after so doing, he said farewell to the group. It's here that he turned back alone. This was a pivotal decision in Yudin's life, and ironically, his illness, perhaps at this time, was responsible for saving his life. This is a moment Yuri would say goodbye to Ludmia and then Zina. In the process, Zina tripped over her equipment, giving Yuri the opportunity to be a gentleman one last time to help her to her feet. As he departed from Dyatlov group, all were sad to see him go. But now the group was down to nine, and they continued forward. Rustam Slobodin taught Zina how to play the mandolin, and the young group talked of love, sitting around a hot stove which Igor had made himself for the trip for warmth 
and for cooking. Then, all packed in for the night, all nine, in close quarters, in one tent. That was just how they did it at the time. Nobody had their individual tents. It was just one, one, I was gonna say big tent, but it really wasn't even a large tent. They, they got familiar with each other. <laughs> and it was this night that they spent their first real night in the wilderness. They were now completely on their own, or so they thought. The bitter winds of the morning of the 29th, the group skied along a trodden Monsi Trail. The Monsi being local tribesmen who rarely interacted with the Russians. They were actually following in the same footprints as a Monsi hunter who had passed by earlier that morning. The local tribesmen were near. Today, the 29th, was also Yuri Dorshenko's birthday. He turned 21. They stopped and set up camp again, but the further north they made it, the colder it got, the thinner the trees became, and the harsher the wind blew. The Olive Group wrote increasingly of the Monsi people, perhaps a reflection of their anxiety. In fact, this day, as they trekked through the forest, they happened upon a Monsi hut in the middle of their path. But the hunter wasn't seen. It became apparent that they were starting to worry about a potential interaction. Members of the group went so far as to write lists of common words that they knew in their diaries should they encounter the Monsi people. Alexander Kolotov, at 24 years old, and although born November 16th, strangely, the group, for some reason, celebrated his birthday on this day, January 30th. We're not exactly sure why they did that, but regardless, his gift was a fresh tangerine. He immediately split it up into eight pieces and distributed it out to all of his friends. Kolvitov was also highly intelligent. He trained in school to be a nuclear physicist working for the Young Communist League. He lived in Moscow alongside other prominent scientists of the day. The next day on January 31st, still following the Mansi Trail, they arrived at the edge of a highland area where they began preparations to go further up the mountainside for the final push toward the top of Mount Oturton. Before they began, they left supplies in the tree line to lighten their load and also to aid for the descent on their way back. On February 1st, no journal entries were recorded, but you couldn't blame them. It was bitterly cold outside in the midst of a snowstorm that suddenly hit. However, after setting up camp upon the side of Colette Siakal, what the natives called Dead Mountain, nearly to their destination, the group did take the time to write whimsical entries in a newspaper they had with them as a team building exercise. The paper gave different topics of which you could write in your own answers just for fun. Under the philosophy section, a member of the group had written, lectures on the topic of love and hiking are given by Dr. Nikolai Thibault and postdoctorate of love science, Dubinina. As fun as this was, this would be the last thing any of the group would ever write. And February 13th came and went and no telegram was received from the group, but there was no initial concern because delays of this type were expected of trips of this length. A few more days went by and eventually family members of the party became concerned and demanded a search be enacted. However, there was no official search until an entire week later, on the 20th. The Olive Group still had not returned or sent a telegram out. There were 120 individuals made up of family members, students, and other government officials who scoured the mountainside splitting into multiple groups as they trekked along their plotted path. Little did they know that Igor had deviated from their path on the last day, and so the search took longer than expected. And it wasn't until nearly a week after the search began on the 26th that the first signs were found on the side of Kolet Siakal. Their tent was found in shambles half buried in the snow, and strangely, there were cuts along the side of it, which, upon forensic examination, was determined 
that they were made from the inside. One of the searchers testified, we managed to identify footprints of eight or nine people starting from the tent and going about one kilometer down the slope and then they were lost. One person was in boots. The others were only in socks and barefoot. For some reason, the group appeared to have cut their way out of the tent in the middle of the night and unbelievably calmly walked down the hill to the tree line, all without footgear on. In fact, most of their boots were actually piled up in one corner of the tent, and Diotlev's flashlight was found on top of the snow, just outside. At first, because they didn't find any bodies in the tent, they hoped, they thought for sure, these guys are survivors, they know how to live out here. They thought for sure that they were bunkering down in nearby abandoned buildings, where there, there were buildings around in the woods for logging, but there was no such luck. The next morning on the 27th, the searchers' fears were realized in full. Yuri Doroshenko was face down in the snow, frozen to death. He had many bruises over his body. There was dried blood and a gray liquid coming out of his mouth and nose. It also appeared that something or someone had been putting significant pressure on his chest prior to his death. One doctor said it looked as though he had been hit by a car. Yuri Krivoshenko was laying face up right next to Doroshenko. Some of his own finger had been bitten off. It was in his own mouth. Investigators suggest that this might have been an attempt to stay awake in the bitter cold, biting his own finger. It wasn't long until another body was found, that of the leader himself. Igor Dyatlov, of which this story in the past and the region has now been named after, was found further away from the tree line, head facing toward the tent and body covered in snow. The knuckles of his hands were bruised, and some suggest that this means he had been in a fistfight. He died of hypothermia. Then, last on the 27th, Zina's body was found, closer to the tent than any other. Her head was facing the tent as well, as if she was trying to get back to the tent. She had more clothing on than the others, with multiple layers, wearing items from the other hikers. She also had a significant large bruise around her torso. Her official cause of death was reported hypothermia due to violent accident. None of these people were wearing shoes. About a week later, the body of Rustem Slobodin was found buried in snow between where Diotlev and Zina Komagorova were found. His head was toward the tent as well. He had two pair of pants on and four layers of socks, but strangely, he actually had one boot on. Knuckles on both his hands and his face were bruised. The search continued on, but the remaining four from the group were nowhere to be seen. An excruciating two months would go by, and on May 5th, the local Mansi people happened upon the body of Ludmia Dubanina. After the snow had started to melt around her body, she was found in a kneeling position near a natural ledge next to flowing water. Her eyes and tongue were missing. Ten of her ribs were broken, and she was wearing Krivoshenko's sweater, which bizarrely was found to be emitting high levels of radioactivity. After Ludmia was found, the search continued, and they scoured the same area, and then Semyon Zolotaryov was found. He was the best dressed of them all with multiple layers of clothing on, and in a den area near to where they found that a fire had been made. Although it would have been uncomfortable, Semyon should not have died of the cold. Like Ludmia, he had multiple broken ribs, and his eyes too were missing. The doctor noted that his skin was a greenish color. He was found with a newspaper, several coins, in his pocket and a compass. Surprisingly, 
He also had a camera around his neck. Yuri Yudin, the surviving member of the group, in a later interview found Semyon's camera to be surprising since he thought the group only had four cameras in total, but this camera around Semyon's neck after the investigation was complete totaled five cameras. For some reason, it appears Semyon, Zolotaryov, the older, last minute addition and stranger to the group, had a secret camera and was able to take it with him when the group mysteriously and abruptly had to leave their tent on the hillside. He had boots on and was dressed more thoroughly than the others. All of the photos of that secret camera, though, unfortunately appeared at first glance to be ruined by the weather. He was also found with a notepad and pen in hand. It was reported by searcher Vladimir Askenadze, who testified upon discovering Semyon that Colonel Otakurov, upon seeing the notebook, immediately grabbed it, then cursed loudly and said, he is writing nothing. The notebook was never filed as evidence and its whereabouts to this day are unknown. Alexander Kolvatov was shortly found thereafter. Like the others, no shoes. He had a broken nose and a broken neck. His sweater was also found to be radioactive, and his skin as well had a green tinge to it. And then finally, Nikolai Thibault, the last of their group, was found. He was found with a severe fracture of the temporal bone. It was suggested that he could have only lived for a few hours after such an injury. He too was also better dressed than the rest of them. With all of the Olive group accounted for, legal proceedings began heating up and investigators attempted to understand what happened to the Olive group, but on May 28th, the case was suddenly closed. The official statement released by lead investigator Lev Ivanov said that the cause of their demise was overwhelming force which the hikers were not able to overcome. And they put the blame squarely on Igor Dyatlov's shoulders for putting the group in such a compromising situation which would ultimately lead to their death. Obviously, that isn't an answer. Overwhelming force? So what was that force? And what on earth happened? Get this video to 100 likes and I will post part two where I will address in depth each primary theory and explain to you what I think happened to the Olive Group on that fateful day on Dead Mountain. Like it with every single one of your accounts and share this video. I am trying to make this storytelling and research channel my full-time job and I love sharing these stories with you. And with this particular story, there is a lot to unpack. There are a lot of theories and a lot of strange things that happened that are hard to account for. Some of the theories that you'll be hearing about in part two are gravitational anomalies, top secret government experiments, avalanches, ball lightning, infighting, and yes, even Yeti attacks. So until this video gets 100 likes, I will see you next time. Keep an eye out, my friends, and stay paranormal.